And hello, everybody. Welcome to WD Carousel of Podcast. My name's Crystal. And I'm Ian. And today we are going to do another Imagineering Spotlight. Yes, or Imagineer. Indeed. Not Imagineering. Yes. Well, he did some Imagineering, but he's a, oh, he he's a guy. Did, he did quite a bit of stuff. <laughs> yes, he did. And honestly, I was really shocked that it took us two year plus years to even think yeah. about discussing him. I know. Well, you know, we had a we had a lot on our minds. I guess <laughs> I, I don't know. Did. No idea. Um, in fact, this is like the original of the Imagineers slash Walt's longest oldest friend slash they could be like twinsies because they were born the same year. Aw, that's um, so cute. Yeah. And so we are going to be discussing Ub Iwerks. And yes, indeed. When I first heard that name, I was giggly. <laughs> it is not a name that in America we are very familiar with. So, yes. Ub. Ub. Ubby. Which is, yeah, which is like, it's, if you, if you haven't guessed, it's very German, um, very uh, North, Northwestern German. So, um, and also, I love the last name Iwerks. I don't know why. It sounds either like it's. It sounds to me like it's a like a like a Silicon Valley tech startup. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, uh, so when the guys first got together, they were really young, and they decided yeah. they were going to start their own company. And so they started their own company, but they were like debating what they were going to call it. And originally, they were going to call it uh, Disney Iwerks, but then that sounded like a glasses store. <laughs> So then they changed it to iWorks Disney. (laughs) Now the company only survived for like a month. Yeah, right. It wasn't. I'm actually I'm actually shocked at how how short that was. Like you can limp along for more than a month and like not do anything. (laughs) I mean, these guys were teenagers. They had met at you know just a Kansas City studio, and they decided we're going to go ahead and we're going to get into just advertising, like. Mm -hmm. animation for ever or not even animation it was just advertising so letter blocking and signage that they were going to get into and the um desire to have that in kansas city in like 1919 didn't really exist um and or it was already caught up by the other existing businesses so they didn't really do that well yeah yeah Anyways, so we're going to talk about UB, and we have a lot of information to go over. Right. Some people might be familiar with like the first little section, which is still quite a bit. But yeah. dude, this guy, like the more <laughs> research guy, I did, <laughs> he's, he's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, he's yeah. It's it's in my in my kind of overview of his life i was just shocked at how far you know what i mean like like you would expect like oh this is the end of his influence nope it, it it's here too like it just it just keeps it just keeps following us wherever we go in the world that we like to cover on this podcast like he just seems to have his hand in all of it in mm-hmm. one way or another yeah and uh what they talked about in the beginning um on the research that i did because there's actually not a lot of research places that you can get for ub like you can find right. information on the nine old men all over the place but right. um the link that i had sent you for my original contact was actually a ted talk by his granddaughter who right. then acknowledges that there was like no research done at all right and no acknowledgement of her grandfather who actually is huge in this company and a huge influencer right right like yeah he- she was yeah so underplayed yeah she she was interesting with the ted talk because you know she basically ended up like stumbling into the the story of her grandfather because she was just trying to figure out who he was <laughs> and like ended up like getting support from disney to like to do that research to, and interview from those roy. people from roy yeah which is which is fascinating that they were yeah. able that she was able to do that and she basically did all the first so i think a lot of the research that exists on him from you know like a modern perspective is from her yeah there's there's one documentary which i did watch mm-hmm. there is a book that came out that was done by his son don and okay. so i have that as well as you know and mm-hmm. really that's the only works that i was able to find on up wow i works okay sorry <laughs> to say 
<laughs> There's going to be a lot of these puns. I can't help it. It just happens with his name. Oh, yeah. It's it's just way too easy. <laughs> okay. So long story, going to try and be as succinct as possible with this. Um, I, I think believe in you. on this note, I'm probably going to take lead. Um, yeah. It's easier to keep one of us on on task on task and then you can add in your quips as we go because yeah i'm excited to learn too <laughs> <laughs> okay so buckle your seat belt kids here we go i'm so, in i'm in miss frizzle let's do this <laughs> i works disney and that company went under within a month then they started what? working for another production house and at that point in time decided to create laughograms laughograms is a company that walt was the head of and ub was the chief animator they came up with the first motorized actually ub specifically came up with the first motorized animation camera so that it could only be run by one person instead of one person oh, okay. holding the films and another person doing the crank for the <laughs> <laughs> for the right, image capture so they, could, so they could actually advance it without yeah. having to sit there and like have somebody up there cool. exactly and they talk about how walt is the like the advertise he's he's the mouth yeah. and ub is the technical person and so you're going to find a lot of ideas thoughts all of that process coming from walt and then the how to's the breakdowns the production all of that coming from ub so they actually really worked well together and um they're the ones that originated the alice alice's wonderland which is a little different than Alice in Wonderland, but it is one of the first <laughs> crossover films of animation as well as live action. There okay. was one that happened prior to this from a different production company where they had a live action background and an animated character would interact or was okay. basically drawn on top. This is the sure. first time where they decided to reverse it. And so they had a live action character, Alice, go hang out in wonderland and so they really just goofed around with white screens to be able to just cut her out and then have her um not touch the characters that were animated but be able to interact and honestly they were so poor that alice had to do all of her takes in one shot <laughs> right and no no retakes they couldn't afford it oh, God. um after a while <laughs> the Alice in Wonderland or Alice's Wonderland animated shorts started to go under. And it was at that point in time that um, Walt moved to California under the okay. suggestion of Roy. Okay. They decided that they're going to put together their last couple thousand dollars each um, Roy Disney and Ub, and they convince Ub to come out for a final six episodes of Alice's Wonderland. They even okay. convince the little actress, the four-year-old and her family, to move out to California as well. Oh, because wow. at that point in time, they were able to secure a contract through um, Minx, which eventually turns into Universal Studios. Got it. Okay. So they have the six episodes left of Alice's Wonderland. And at that point in time, that's when they start creating more animation again, just solid animation. And that's where Oswald right. comes from. Now, the amazing thing about Oswald, the lucky rabbit, for people who aren't familiar with it, yes. is that he was the first animated character that actually had like independent atomic body parts so up until this point almost all animation was very stick form and very rigid okay. and it was through ub's intervention of animation that you had curvy lines and like you'd have like body parts that were able to be used for different things and like pop off an arm or stretch a neck right. or things that we're familiar with now with cartoons um but a lot of the like even the jitteries and the wavy lines was a whole new aspect of animation oh yeah yeah which created, they call that uh, rubber hose rubber yeah. hose animation yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um Ub was especially known for the 
gag of being able to like pick something up and have the arm twirl around the body like a helicopter and make it look (laughs) fluid and that was a like a standard style for him and in fact almost everything that we equate to old style cartoons nowadays actually were either ub or inspired by the movements ub created through animation so oh, wow. turning things into See. planes, taking thought bubbles and like making them real balloons and attaching them to, you know, this character or this or that. And it's just it's crazy the amount of crazy stuff that he was able to come up with. Yeah. Wow. Um, and because of that, Oswald became super popular. Right. Um, at that time, though, uh, their contract was coming up. Walt contract with the universal producers minx specifically and and he goes to new york and finds out that not only are they not renewing the contract with what is now turned into disney brothers cartoon studios right but minx had basically stolen every single animator that had worked on oswald from underneath walt's knows oh they basically hired them out of disney brothers oh yeah and the only one who turned them down was up wow and then that's when yeah walt got the news that nope the rabbit's ours you can't have it it's under our contract (laughs) bye-bye and so that's that's when the well-known train ride back where he first thought of another character and so he's like we need to have another character we need to be able to do this roy ub and walt sit down and they like brainstorm all of these animals they're like cats now cats have already been done um dogs nah you know they go through all these animals and eventually a mouse pops up so then ub is like okay i can work with this and so like that first night alone i think he made like 300 sketches or something like that Whoa. just to solidify <laughs> the image of the three circle mouse that we're familiar with yeah and then they're like yes let's do this go for it go on you got this and they're like doing all this pep talk to talk to ub and ub's like okay i'm gonna do this and they're keeping this all on the download too because they don't want anybody to know that they came up with a new character and a new concept and they're just right. gonna create the first cartoon Okay. And so Ub single handedly wrote or drew 700 drawings a day and was able to get plain crazy done within a matter of like weeks. The entire animated short of plain crazy was illustrated by Ub Iwerks. Just a single animator for an entire short yeah. film. Like, that's crazy. That does, that's like, it's just unheard of. <laughs> Seriously. Like, and the only people that they had in the company at that time were Walt and Lillian, Roy yep. and his wife, who was also in the, you know, ink and paint area. Yeah. Not yeah. department yet. That's way in the future. And then, up. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so it's wow. just like the five of them just sitting there, like, trying to make this all work. Um, wow and so like i said walt came up with script personality they also attribute him to the soul he's basically the mouth of the company charismatic very very able to get people on board and to encourage yeah. people and excite people and like i said ub did all the background stuff images technical layout processes all of that stuff for the first like huge chunk of mickey's life wow it kind of reminds me of uh like the the disney iworks dynamic kind of reminds me of like the steve Jobs, steve wozniak dynamic Mm -hmm. and again where where, yeah there's only one name that's really familiar exactly which is unfortunate super unfortunate Mm because as you're gonna see and we keep going there's so much more that ub's contributed 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so we get to Steamboat Willie. Okay. As we're all familiar with, Steamboat Willie is the first animation that actually was able to sync to sound. And it was because Ub put in beat marks on the film that the conductor was able to follow and match. So originally, oh. Disney had had a hard time getting the conductor because they had gotten this whole orchestra together <laughs> to be able to synchronize it. And they weren't able to follow along because they didn't know when things were coming up. And so Ub right. put intentionally put beat marks on there so that way you could keep up with it and understand the layout of the music and timing and pacing and all of that that's really cool i mean that's like he basically just built a metronome into the celluloid like that's that's super cool Mm -hmm. and then they decided okay so we can put music to an animation what if we made an animation to music and the first time that they did that was actually the skeleton dance we're familiar with things like fantasia where they take these huge pieces of classical music and illustrate to them but this is well before that and so there was a song that came out or that was composed and Ub got really inspired by it and was like, I'm going to do all these dancing skeletons, which is honestly one of my favorite things to watch in Halloween. (laughs) But he's like having like the bones fall off and they're becoming musical instruments and they're hopping around and doing a whole bunch of things that obviously regular bodies can't do. Do. But it was such a celebration of what he could do. And then After that, Walt became a little bit more strict on timing and started Mm. to take away some of the control that Ub had had in these early animations as far as like timing and what he wanted to happen and when. And so Ub didn't like that. Ub didn't like that Walt was basically boxing him and taking away his creative yeah. freedom and saying that you have yeah. to have this this whole thing done in this many frames or this whole thing done in this many seconds. Right. So he just got up and left. Like Walt was off advertising for the skeleton dance. And <laughs> Ub goes to Roy, I quit. And oh Roy God. has to send a telegram to Walt <laughs> <laughs> to be like, uh, we just lost Ub. You lost the dude. <laughs> You lost the guy who's making the sausage. Well, what are we going to do? We just lost Ub. Oh, my God. So that, that was kind of a blow. I mean, at that point in time, they already had a couple other people working in animation. And they were, you know, through the success of Steamboat Willie and other productions, right. Silly Symphonies, that sort of thing. They had a staff that they were able to pretty much cover at that point in time. As sure. Ub decides to create his own studio. And in fact, he was approached by the um, company that initiated the sound processing for Steamboat Willie. Oh, okay. To follow Ub. Okay. Even though even though they had originally been working with, with you the know, Disney Studio. The Disney Studios. Right. They're like, right. eh, we're gonna follow Ub because right. we know this guy. Is and awesome. we know what he's capable of. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And cool. Ub's, Ub starts up a studio and it's becoming, you know, the depression, prohibition, all that craziness right. that happened around that time. And yeah. honestly, it didn't really affect them at all. They were just making <laughs> so much money with animations huh. and they were hiring and he had so many people big names that came to work underneath him and that went on to do better things so like the wow. creator of bugs bunny worked wow. for him the creator of betty boop worked for him the create like it's so many big huge list yeah and they just worked wow. under of iWorks in iWorks studios um <laughs> at that point in time he decided he needed his own character his own animal character yeah and course. created flip the frog classic (laughs) so the thing about ub's animation style too Mm -hmm. is it is it is rather risque there are times where it is raunchy Mm. they have no problem with like flip being a peeping tom through a window or a girl's skirt being blown up or like there are some things that as we see it now um though i don't think they realized it back then were racist so they had like animated characters of you know asian countries or india or that sort of thing that they 
made fun of and played up the right. you know those sorts the of things the state, right and it started getting really really deep um and really dark uh yikes yeah so the one thing that i'm going to bring up is they did create one of the most famous forms of animation techniques through um ub's studio that waltz attributed for um and it's the multiplane camera and, oh really yeah so comic color cartoons was something that ub decided he was going to get into that's kind of like silly symphonies okay but it's the first time where they had like a multiplane camera but unlike walt or the disney multiplane camera where it's a story mm -hmm. you know with different heights uh ub's was originally i think it was horizontal and oh. so they had the cranks and everything and you could like stand and look down the camera instead of having to climb this tower and then look got it so the they actually they, i could so i could see why they why the floor is better for positioning things but i could see the horizontal one being really convenient for a lot of stuff too yeah interesting yeah huh. um and like he created that in 1933 dang so there is a comic color cartoon which i think is the ideal example of like ub at his creative freedom worst <laughs> oh boy best please do tell i mean i i enjoyed <laughs> it because i'm twisted but sure. it's it's basically called balloon city okay and so there's just a whole city of all these different little balloons and the big boogeyman is the pincushion man and mm -hmm. they're like the pincushion man doesn't exist and then all of a sudden he pops up and he's like murdering people left and right and they're like little balloons so they're popping <laughs> i mean think about it kind of like um bing bong in inside oh, out and cloud city soon. people <laughs> I mean, too soon. kind of so i mean you're not seeing blood spatter and everything but no. like he's flat out like torturing and murdering people like popping arms and then popping Jeez. a head and all of this and it's just crazy and then that's when the film censor censorship like organization yeah came into play and was like no, oh, no. you can't have sexual connotations to animation you can't have racist connotations to animation you can't have murder <laughs> and those sorts of things represented in animation um <laughs> i think that came out in like 1933 as well so like balloon city okay. is one of the last things that he worked on um but it basically took away everything that he'd been doing and oh, nobody no. was interested in his animation anymore so right. his studio went under no at that time, take a breath. <laughs> Someone from Disney Animation finds out that Ub is recently free. Unemployed. Free, yeah. We're going to say. And is yeah. like, you know, Walt, what do you think about if we get him back on the team? And Walt's like, well, we can ask him. And they yeah. do. And he says, I'll come back. I have no animosity towards you guys. But I refuse to be in animation again i'm not going to draw oh okay. so at that point in time okay. he puts down his pencil and gets behind the camera okay and okay. starts coming up with everything else that most people aren't familiar with because they might <laughs> know of as far as what he's produced things that he's done yeah you know he made such big advances into the animation world that yeah. he took it from the little nothing shorts ahead of a feature film into being what people come to see. And then there's a feature mm -hmm. film, supposedly. Right, like, right. they were more concerned about, like, the Mickey shorts and that sort of thing. He created so much. But right. at that point in time, that's where a lot of people's knowledge of UB stops. Stops. Yeah. So yeah. he comes back. And he's part of the Walt Disney Company. And... The first thing that he does is Ub creates an optical printer. So at this point in yeah. time, this is when they're doing, he comes back during the war films that are being done. And mm -hmm. he is trying to take live action 
actors Mm -hmm. as well as locations um he had to bring back some of the techniques that he had been using for alice's wonderland where it was the white screen yeah it's they call it a a luminance key where they just blank out everything they can use that like a true color of like one pure color can be used to isolate a subject but they figured out how to do that for live action to live action so this was the time where they were able to have like some actors in a boat and then be able to have like the river scene behind them Mm -hmm. from france without having to spend the money to ship everybody off to france France. to be able to do this um a lot of those techniques became what we know as blue screen green screen screen. what we're familiar with now he's the one sorry (laughs) it's okay (laughs) (laughs) he's the one who created the optical printer wow they still use that they use that up until like the late 90s Mm -hmm. (laughs) like that's like that technology was very much relevant in fact i think they still use some of that tech for like making like 35 millimeter prints today like that Mm -hmm. like the thing that'll print stuff on there like they've actually like they still use that kind of technology speaking of 35 millimeter prints he also figured out a way to eliminate scratches from the film through a liquid immersion because at that point in time almost anything that had been filmed if light hit it just wrong there might be a little crease on the on the film but once you blow that up to theater sizes it's huge Mm -hmm. and so Mm -hmm. he came up with a process of being able to take the printed film and it went into this liquid immersion bath yeah. Before it was um, re-rolled up and through that re-rolling, it came out of the bath and mm-hmm. the chemicals would dry off, but it ca- basically sealed the film so you could put it in a container and you wouldn't have to worry about it scratching. Wow. So, I mean, it's behind the scenes stuff, but this is stuff that we don't even think of that he yeah. came up with, tor- t- you know, techniques and. Um, to fix it so that way it wasn't an issue in the future another one that he came up with was souvenir cells for collections you know how you might have like a still image of this film or that film he figured out a way to take a photo of the finished film that had been that had been recorded from the multiplane camera so that way you could get like a souvenir film from lady and the tramp oh a souvenir cell Oh, cool. Like yeah. just one singular frame. Yeah. So he was able to, Neat. he used a Kodak um, Technochrome. I don't, don't quote me yeah. on that. But I yeah. know he used a Kodak product to be able to capture. Kodak- that's, was it Kodachrome? That sounds right. Okay. Um, yeah. To be able to capture all of these cells to make souvenirs to then have Walt be able to give away, advertise, give to investors who are funding the animation movies that are coming out. And it was a huge, you know, addition to the souvenir world at that point in time because nobody had little shots of, you know, movies. That would be, that would be, that would have been just unbelievably cool. Wow yeah (laughs) another innovation he came up with large matte paintings basically sets scenes oh yeah yeah instead of having to go to location build a huge set with hundreds of you know extras for cast yeah he used one of the ones that came up with using a large matte painting yeah to you know show off where they're supposed to be a good visual of that is Mary Poppins. So the floating in that she does in the title sequence. Yeah. That is a huge matte photo. Yeah. Or image that they took video of and then placed her on top of as she was able to float in. And, <laughs> you know, set painting has become a huge thing since then. Oh, but yeah. Up oh, until yeah. then, everybody was going on location. And yeah, it took a <laughs> long time and it took a lot of money for them to make those large matte yes. paintings. But they saved a lot in flights, in hotels, yeah. in, you know, casting, in all of that stuff. 
Yeah, and you also get a lot of control. Other thing is shooting on location from a production standpoint can be a nightmare. Like you have to control the location, you have to do all that stuff. When you're shooting with with a large map painting, you're usually in your own soundstage or rented soundstage and you have complete control of the space, which is really, really nice for production teams. So yet again, another thing that yeah. is 100% the behind the scenes, but it's become the normal Yeah, for any that's, sort that's... of filming. Wow, that's fascinating. Another thing that I thought was really interesting that I never would have like guessed who or what was when they were creating the Mickey Mouse Club. And they had multiple cameras going with multiple different angles. He was the one who mm-hmm. figured out how to do the electronic editing to match mm. up the three editing terminals to oh, cool. be able to stop at the same time. So then they could change the film. Now, that with us, that's easy just to press a button now yeah. on our editing yeah. systems and to have everything stop at once. Yep. Instead of having like three separate people coordinating and being like, one, two, three, stop. He was able to do the, you know, mechanics to make it electronic. So that way, if he pressed stop, all three machines would stop at once. Stop. Yeah. I know that sounds cuts easy. Yeah. yeah, It sounds so minuscule, but it was a huge thing. Yeah. Oh, it's (laughs) like multi-camera editing is still like one of the biggest like things with editing. That's that can be really crazy. And that's that is like the first step is like being able to make sure that you can maintain sync on all those cameras when you're stopping and starting and cutting. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. I did not know that he was involved with that at all. Yeah. And it started because of the Mickey Mouse Club. Wow. The next couple you should be familiar with. (laughs) I am familiar with the very next one. Yes, I am familiar with Um, with when we talked about this a little bit when we talked about 101 Dalmatians. Um, but the the Xerox method for cell animation uh, allowed for the animators themselves to be able to do their to be able to run their friends <laughs> explaining all this, but being able to like use their own work to duplicate for doing paints and, and actual frames that would end up in the in the shot, which created a very different look. Uh, and it was it was brand new for that movie. It was mm-hmm. like you know was that like sixty three. It saved want? money. It saved time. It saved labor. It's labor, yeah. Um, materials. I mean, everything to be able to take yeah. an image and put it in Just, a copy machine, essentially, yep, and be yep. able to get an image back. Have a new one. I yep. mean, that really streamlined the animation process some more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the next one, Walt decides that he wants to have a traveling museum. Because why not? classic to world. basically kind of advertise for sleeping beauty i mean it had already been out a little bit but it was hugely popular and it was beautiful and walt wanted to have animation going that was continuous without playing mm-hmm. the whole movie and at that point in time you know you'd play through a reel and then you'd mm-hmm. have to rewind the reel and then you'd have to yep. restart the reel. And right. so I was able to come up with an animation or a looped animation projection machine. Oh, yeah, sure. So that way it only played the same loop, but it continued until you turned it off. So then right. we had to stop, rewind, press play yeah. again, essentially. Yeah, like an, an endless loop film. Yeah. Interesting. Another thing that he came up with were... Um, this is where we're getting into him Uh, going to work for wed unofficially okay Okay. so we're kind of leaving the theater version of ub behind Mm -hmm. and we're moving into the wed version of ub wed version yeah and so when they were coming up with Disneyland and specifically new attractions and they would make all of these tiny models, mm-hmm. what he would do is he figured out how to make a camera small enough and have it on like a little a little slide so you could actually see the model as if you were in the ride. Right. Oh, cool. Which, again, sounds like so normal and expected. But until he came up with it, they were just looking at the model and being like, well, it looks good from here. But once you're able to like shrink yourself down and get into it, 
and see all the it, little details, see angles. Is this going to work? Is that going to work? I mean, right. Perspective. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Perspective is everything. Um, in the attractions for like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, um, the Sleeping Beauty Castle walkthrough, and a whole bunch of other ones. Ub was the one who cre- created the visual effects of like dry water or like light waves oh, to make it look yeah, like yeah. water through yeah. two rotating glass discs or like fire or that sort of thing. I know that there are right. um, the, you know, torches in pirates of the caribbean that are flickering and he's the one who came up with that and you know all of those lighting effects he's the one who came up with the way to impersonate water or fire Fire. or you know those other elemental actions that nobody had been able to duplicate until him yeah he also that's cool and this is this is a huge one for people who are at the parks. He yes. came up with the Circa camera for yes. 360 filming. Yes. For Circle Vision filming. <laughs> so that is a technique that started in Disneyland mm-hmm. and um, has been used all over Disney properties, has been brought to World's Fairs, has been brought to many other things. I mean, planetariums right now use it and mm-hmm. other big screen sort of projection yeah. shows I yeah mean, it's very common in like museum installations and stuff yeah yeah but he was the first one to figure out like let's put an odd number of cameras facing out and yeah. let's just drive or fly yeah. and show everybody what it's like to what was it um you know across america was one of them you know oh canada's another one <laughs> I was about to say, oh, Canada, like, always stands out to me. (laughs) I love oh, Canada. It's horrible. I love it. I know. It's terrible and it's my favorite. (laughs) But, you know, circle vision is a huge thing. And he's the one who came up with the technique of being able to use an odd number of cameras to be able to then, you know, not just film, but project around you that created a continuous loop. So you could literally be standing in the middle and turn around and see a 360 view of wherever the video is from, wherever the film's going to be from. Right. And that was a huge innovation that Ub came up with. A couple last ones. I'll just say them real quick. Haunted Mansion. He's the one who came up with the projection scaping for the singing busts and Madame Mm. Leota's face. Um, Working with the textured faces, but being able to get them to sing and interact. It was, you know, pretty, pretty innovative at that time. Early, early projection mapping. That's still exciting. Now we have projection mapping on top of castles and trees and anything else. Whatever. (laughs) As well as he assisted with the light act, light activated cam machines for Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln for the 1964 world's fair, as well as other animatronics. So like it's a small world and a lot of the initial animatronic sort of activation. Yeah. 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 He died in 1971, so okay. five years after Walt, due to a heart attack. Mm-hmm. And then he was inducted as a Disney legend in 1989 with the Nine Old Men. Wow. And that is a lot about <laughs> Ub, but that's barely scraping the surface scraping as you surface. know. Yes. At this point, it's... I was just like, okay, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, bullet, bullet point. point. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh... He's it's I I didn't realize how one person that there was one person that had so much attributed to him like in just and in, nobody in knows about him like right. unless you are a diehard Disney nerd or an yeah. animation nerd right but then even with yeah. the animation nerd you'd only like it would stop mm-hmm once he left, once he stopped doing animation stuff, then like you wouldn't have noticed anymore. But his legacy just goes on for so long. That's and his crazy. son started working for the Disney company and picked up in his yep. father's shoes. Like they worked together on a lot of the web products or wow. projects. Yeah. Um, his granddaughter is in filming and directing, and like it's become a whole like family legacy. Yeah, yeah. The, the stuff that Ub started with. 
Wow. And nobody knows who he is. That's so crazy. Yeah. Just amazing. Well, and it's like we always knew, even from fairly early on, we were kind of like just talking about uh, Imagineers and the Nine Old Men and all that stuff. He always, he was always there and he was always like present and part of it. But like I didn't really realize like that that depth. It's just crazy. Yeah. Crazy. And I'm, I'm glad we got to do this a little bit of a spotlight. I feel like he needs a lot more um, acknowledgement for the yeah. amount of work that he has not just contributed to the Walt Disney Company, but to film in general. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just from my the stuff that that that, that we, you were going through, this was stuff that applied to me throughout like film school. Like this was mm-hmm. all, and I had no idea that he had anything to do with that. Like I had yeah. no idea. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. And I mean, he did win like tons of awards for this. Like I remember sure. reading at one point in time that they had made up a technical award just to give him an Oscar <laughs> because of the amount of stuff that he came out with that yeah. year. They're like, oh, yeah, by the way, I know this isn't a category, but there's only one person anyway. So here you go, Ub. Jeez. This is awesome. Thanks for they doing actually- all this, guys. I think that that became an award that they established after that because now yeah. like 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 software and hardware for the film industry now mm-hmm. those people get awards for that now but that mm-hmm. was never a thing before mm-hmm. just, that's just fascinating. Yeah. Wow. So oh, if heavens. you <laughs> if you are interested in Ub's work um I cannot recommend highly enough the book it's Walt Disney's ultimate inventor, a gen- the genius of Ub Iwerks. I'm going to have the image. I'm going to hold it up real quick. Yay. And it is amazing. Like, the animation part is barely the first quarter of the book. And the rest of it yeah. is him after he puts down the pencil. Wow. I mean, there's so That's much amazing. stuff to cover. I didn't even cover everything. Um, and then there is the hand behind the mouse, which is the documentary that you can watch. And that one was done by his granddaughter. There's mm-hmm. the Ted talk. And really that's all I was able to find. So I would encourage you to spread the story of up because he yeah. needs a lot more recognition than he's getting. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, on that note, this has been a long one. Thank you so much for sticking (laughs) around with us. Right. Uh, This has been WD Carousel of Podcast. My name's Crystal. And I'm Ian. And we hope you have a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Bye.